Hello, hello. I am Angel. Welcome to Conversations in Anarchy. We are so happy to have you here with us today. We are talking nonviolent physical communication. We're talking protection. We're talking personal responsibility today. Um, we are so happy to have you with us. Uh, I, as I said, an angel. I am the, let's see, the content creator, the editor of the Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy, the Anarchopoco blog, and I have been working with David on the Free Your Family camp, coming up with all kinds of great activities for your kids, and David's coming up with all kinds of great content for you parents and your kids. Um, we have set up this whole conversation, this whole community, in order, in order to do a couple of things. One is really to foster community, to reach out to our community, to touch base, to start a conversation, to flow with each other and teach each other. This is a place where we converse and learn and learn how to converse. Uh, we want to be building community year round. We also want to break down the stigma behind anarchy. I mean, I always say that everybody should meet an anarchist. And I like to say that I'm an anarchist because I want to present, I want to put the, the best foot forward so that when you hear the word anarchy, you don't think of all this crazy stuff in the media, like conflict and destruction. What you think about is people like us, who we really are, right? Really trying to connect with ideas and be free. And so that's what Conversations is all, in Anarchy is all about. Conversations in Anarchy has been hosted by Catherine Bleich, David Rodriguez, and myself. David, would you please take a couple of seconds to introduce yourself? Yes, I love freedom, and I've been attending Narcopoco for the last five years. It'll be my sixth year in a row, and I just want to promote voluntary relationships because I'm a principal of a private school, and I do homeschool consulting. One of my big passions is empowering young people and helping them learn about nonviolence, peaceful relationships, and that's why I'm excited for today's call. Um, also, just to help these kids get out of the school systems and allow them to pursue their interests, their passions, and their dreams we're talking video technology. So imagine what's going to happen in five years and 10 years with the world. You know, amazing things are going to happen for your children and mine and for this next generation. And so we're promoting freedom and responsibility and new paradigms. I think it's kind of the word that's been resonating with me for um, the last year or two. And so understanding there's new discoveries, innovations, and the fact that uh, Dale Brown's joining us. I'm really excited because he's been doing it for over two decades. And I can't wait to, uh, for you all to meet him and hear some of the, the tactics and philosophies that he's been using in the real world, not in theory, but in the real world. So I hope you guys have some great questions because he's the, the guy with a lot of answers. Um, and uh, I'm really excited that uh, you're going to be joining here live and hopefully you'll be joining us in Anarchapoco in about two weeks. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I love what you're doing with your school as a homeschooling mom. I am like, get all the kids out of those prisons, as you say. Um, so awesome. So yeah, as you mentioned, we are we have a special guest tonight, uh, Dale Brown of the Detroit Management Center. So we're excited for him to share all of his experience and wisdom with us. Uh, and that's going to be great. He is a featured speaker speaker on the main stage at Anarchapulco and will be hosting a workshop on February 15th. And I think after tonight, you're going to see that he has a lot of value to share. So you're going to want to make that part of your Anarchapulco vacation. Um, so first we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Let's see, we try to keep these sessions to about an hour. A lot of times we go over because everyone is so, you know, into the conversation. So we can go a little bit over if that happens. If there's a flow going with the conversation, we'll keep it going. Um, we, are, we are a welcoming community. That's what we're trying. We're trying to bridge the gap between where we are and where other people are. And we want to meet people where they are. So this is all about reaching out to the community and uh, having people discover us. Uh, we are streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and DLive. And so welcome to everyone from all of the different platforms joining us and becoming part of our community. We appreciate you. Um, 
we, if you want to participate in this conversation, which we encourage, we want to hear what you have to say. We want your feedback. We want you asking questions. Please, you can indicate that in the chat or you can use the raise your hand feature. Um, so, and I guess, Cat, not Cat, I'm sorry, Cat. Um, David and Jessica will be watching that and I will watch that. And by the way, I just want to say hello to all of the people. Hey, Danny, hey, Ken, Michael, Moose, for all of the people who keep coming back week after week after week and joining us. Yay! <laughs> it's always so fun to see you. And I love that I'm going to see you, that we are all going to see each other in just a couple of weeks. So, Again, raise your hand if you have a question and we'll try to get to all of the questions. We encourage you to say hello and let us know what part of the world you're from. Austin, Texas, right here. Um, so yeah, let us know. We have an international community and it's fun to know that we have little pockets of freedom springing up all over the world. So go ahead and add that into the chat wherever you're from. Um, we encourage you to show your beautiful freedom faces. It's not required, but it is nice. Um, and we don't want you to be shy. Let us meet you. Let us meet you. Um, but we want to meet you where you are, so whatever you're comfortable with, you don't have to turn on your camera in order to be a part of the conversation. Feel free to just be on audio um, if that's where you feel comfortable. We want to invite you and make you feel so welcome that being on video is, is not um, is not something you're too shy to do. So let's, again, we'll meet you where you are. Uh, keep your questions brief so that we can have everyone get a chance to talk so we can answer your questions. Um, this whole this whole conversations in anarchy has really centered around the ebook, The Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy, was written, which was written by David Rodriguez and uh, which I edited also by Evan. Um, so it, we've been using it as our guide for our conversation. The ebook is a, a primer on anarchist philosophy and it kind of lays out what we believe in terms of all of the different issues it's interesting when you have principles people do tend to believe a lot of the same things even though there's a lot of diversity which is also part of what these conversations are about um, but I encourage you to go to anarchapoco.com download the ebook give it to a friend, give it to a family member, um, and, and sign up for the Zoom series if you haven't done that and you're on one of the other platforms and you wanna be a part of the conversation. We know you have something of value to add. Uh, so with that said, let's get into it. So we asked Dale to be a part of the conversation tonight because for, uh, the last couple of weeks leading into Anarchapulco, we really have been focused on our theme, Evolve, right? And a part of that is a lot of it has been about communication. You know, we talked with Chris Melchizedek about connecting with ourselves and setting the intention to evolve out of anger and into peace and productivity. We talked to Becca Sagani about peaceful relationship building and conversational conflict resolution. Um, she's been a wonder this year with that uh, in the anarchist community. Tonight, we are going to talk about how we interact with people physically how do we want to be in someone else's space how are we in they in their space and what we do when we feel threatened and this is a really important thing because a lot of times we are using a lot of emotional responses and and that can be anger and fear and instead of de-escalating problems there can be a tendency to escalate them and so we are lucky to have Dale here tonight, who is going to explain to us how we can be better in threatening situations. You know, we've had some focus on the nonviolent communication, but sometimes you're scared. So that's, that's where we want to go. Hey, Dale, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Give us your background. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a... Uh um, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's where University of Michigan is. Uh, my father is a school teacher, retired school teacher, uh, high school school teacher, and a baseball coach. My mother's a physician. And so I come from a, a background in extreme education 
And I'm a person who was the most uneducated person in my family. Educationally abortive is the term used to describe me. And I have uh, uh, was able to financially retire at age 30. <laughs> and my mother still had to work till to 70. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in my world, um, I was told that education uh, in the government way of thinking and the whole thought process uh, behind that was the way to have greater life. And that I was told that thinking outside the box was uh, not just inappropriate, it was um, a path towards uh, failure. And uh, I've uh, since created an entire educational system. I'm uh, someone who um, did not do well in uh, traditional schools, in government schools. So I created my own school. And the people that are in my school that I created are not just financially successful, they're also alive. They have the people stay alive. And the education system I created teaches people specifically how to stay alive, help other people stay alive, do that nonviolently. And the way to do that is to not have fear. And you can't do anything as long as you are in fear. And so when people say to you, let's go be nice to people, let's live a peaceful life, let's be peaceful people, that sounds like a great plan until we're faced with a situation that we feel fear. And fear is a natural uh, indicator that we lack the knowledge to manage a situation. So if you were to say, oh, hey, uh, go manage that uh, electrical box. I'm not an electrician, so I'll be fear of managing electrical issues. Uh, so I'm educated. And so what I did was create a, I created an actual real-life training system, and we had a chance for the past 25 years to, to actually see it empirically, what actually happens. So it's not theory. What happens if someone has a gun, a knife? What happens if we try to kill you or try to kill someone else? And then how do you manage that issue? And more importantly, how do you create conditions where there is no violence? How do you create, a de how do you de-escalate a situation? How do you know what escalation is? How can you use your understanding of psychology to create a non-violent situation uh, outcome by understanding how to create a non-adversarial interaction? Uh, and that's what it was an entire science that's based on a foundation of love of humanity. So once you look at people as family, once you realize that all humans are people, they're all valuable, they're all extended members of your human family, then you will approach them differently than you would if you thought of them as viol violent or some type of target or the enemy. Uh, and so once you start looking at people as family, that's when we teach police officers, we teach civilians, uh, you know, you look at every person as though they're your family and then and this is why I tell my men, my, my staff members, male and female, yeah. when they have a situation, I ask them, if this was your family member, would you have said that? Would you have done that same thing you just did? Would you have done something differently if that was your family member? And what you'll find is if you just use that as your, your uh, metrics, uh, what you'll see is that people will do the right thing if they just make that one simple psychological transition to look at people as family. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, I, and, I, and I really want to follow that avenue, too, because it's, it's all about looking with love. But before we get into that, you said you have a school. What's the name of your school? And you kind of briefly mentioned that you train police officers. What, what's the nature of this school? So the name of my school is Detroit Threat Management Center. I started in 1993 teaching in the parks in Detroit, teaching police. How did it fail? My objective was to create a school that learn how to defend yourself with a knife, a gun, a pistol, a shotgun, a rifle, how to defend yourself standing up, fighting on the ground, how to defend yourself uh, legally so you could not be prosecuted. I didn't have any money, so I didn't know about lawsuits. But once I started making money, I understood about lawsuits. So once again, law became even more important. So not only is it, does, does law determine whether you get to go free or not, it, gets, it means whether you get to go free and remain poverty free. Because if you don't want to lose all of your money, you don't want to be violent even when you're legally correct at being violent. So there is no prosperity in violence. And so uh, I had to learn that my entire way of thinking, all of my education, all of my training, my whole life in martial arts, uh, in firearm schools, and I was an airborne paratrooper. Uh, I was a private investigator when I got the military. I really thought of the world as physical and I thought of the world in, in terms of, you know, right and wrong. And I thought of it in terms of legal, illegal. Um, and so I thought, you know, 
if there had to be violence, I wanted to make sure that I would be the best person to manage violence by being better at violence than violent people. Uh, and as a result, I became really good at violence. Now, if you scale that out, if you're being really good at violence, you're just being more violent. So if you got you and another person are being violent towards violent people, that's just more and more violence. And it just escalates and continues to escalate. And from more violence creates more violence. It's inevitable that uh, you're going to destroy yourself and everything you thought you were, you were going to care about uh, by using violence as the solution for violence. It just really isn't. Uh, and so, but I had to, I had to literally, uh, starting, um, let's say the end of the nineties, after many years of violence, uh, I had to, I had to rethink everything as I evolved. It was a process of evolution. And that's why I call our organization an evolutionary infrastructure. Uh, and I call our training evolution. Every week, our staff members have to train and they're training in psychology, law, skills every week and tested every week. Uh, they're all terminated if they're inappropriate. So uh we are very very structured and uh, uh love is really the the cornerstone of the foundation of all of our staff members and what we expect of them when they're out protecting people and to, to be to, to make sure we're clear on what that means uh we look at uh what police do as law enforcement the enforcement of laws uh what we do is protection so i'm very offended when people call us private police because we don't privately police anyone. If police was a word that meant protection, um, then you'd know it by now. Uh, it doesn't mean that. It means enforcement of laws. And so we don't enforce laws. We create uh, a good place to live and a good place to work. And we do that by creating conditions for there not to be violence, which has nothing to do with the enforcement of laws. And so, uh, uh, one of the things I, I'm really happy about in terms of being uh, involved with the uh, anarchists, libertarians, other people that like freedom is that I created a system to support that. So if you don't want uh, violence with your neighbor, I do violence with neighbors. Primarily what I deal with are communities and corporations that uh, were self-funded. So I had to use sweat equity to create my organization. I started with a dog and a rifle in 1994. I transitioned from uh, just training people to actually protecting them. And I did it not by a choice or money. It was because on the east side of Detroit, the families were being home invaded. They were being robbed. They were being murdered all in my one square block. And there was no help. I called the police every day. The police knew my name. 911 operators knew my name. It, they're doing their job. The police, their job was to come there and enforce laws. Like after your rape robber killed, they will then enforce laws. And that's fine. Except what if you did not want that to happen in your community? to your family, uh, to your employees. So what I did was created a system to support not having rape, robbery, and killing in your community, for your family, for your corporation, and do it legally without violating people's civil rights, without violating their personal um, space, without making them feel oppressed. No reason that you have to violate someone else for your feeling of safety or uh, disrespectful and, um, you can be humble, you can be respectful, and you can be polite and still create a safe, successful environment. And I didn't know this at the time, but when you don't have violence, when you don't have predation, you have actual profit. It's, an, it's a nationally occurring event. So when the families weren't being home invaded, when the families weren't being uh, killed in their homes, uh, raped, robbed, what happened was occupancy for the wealthy increased in their buildings, apartment buildings. Uh, the the fact that they were wealthier made means that our actions of keeping regular families, uh, working class families, uh, poor people and working class people safe meant that the rich people got richer. And what I did was charge them more money. And in return, they got more money. So the police got more money because there was more tax money. The police got all the credit because all the rape, robbery, and, and killing stopped in our area. Uh, and, and I'm fine. That's fine. I don't need the credit. Uh, the families were alive and they're happy because they're not being raped, robbed, killed in their homes. Uh, and as a result, I'm able to charge rich people money. If you don't mind thinking something, it generates the money. So everyone's a winner by creating peaceful environments. You create a peaceful environment that's protected, not prosecuted. Protection is the opposite of prosecution. Protection means nothing happened. Yeah. Nothing happened. So you have to create a metrics of positive, which means no one got arrested because 
No one did. He didn't get arrested. Uh, also, it means that you have to uh, focus on uh, people safety, not enforcement of rules. So when I go to a situation, uh, for example, this is something we run into. People are drunk in a car. I, I guess that's illegal. So <laughs> they're sitting there, their foot's on the gas pedal or the brake. They're literally in traffic. Now, we call the police because this is a legal matter on public streets. We're required to do that. And then we go and get the from the window, talk to the person, get them to wake up and ask them to give us their keys uh, and ask them for a phone number of their family member that we can call. And then we put their keys in the back seat somewhere where they can find it later when they're sober. And meanwhile, we just stop them from driving this car uh, and killing themselves or killing someone else. Uh, and the uh, family members come and pick them up. And what's interesting is in, in more than one situation, police officers have said to us, you know, if the person doesn't have the keys, they don't have control of the car, so we can't prosecute them. And I said, I understand that, but what we're here to do is make sure that person doesn't even drive into you while they're drunk and kill you as an officer or kill the family members in this area or kill themselves because they were drunk driving. Okay? We didn't right. take the keys. We asked, and we put the keys in their back seat, hiding them in the back seat of the crack of the vehicle. So we use strategy. Uh, we don't have to buy. If you said, no, I'm not giving you keys, we're not going to take the keys either. We're going to um, talk to them and, and inhibit them from moving as much as we can. Uh, but still, we're going to be very careful not to violate their rights as well. Uh, and that's where it does get gray. But uh, you're going to be good at convincing them not to continue on. And, and it's always worked. So we've never had a problem. We've been able to, every person we've come across that's either been high or drunk or uh, inebriated in, in a way that they're incapacitated, We've been able to get them medical assistance, get their family to help them, uh, and do so without getting them prosecuted, uh, because that's our objective, is to make sure that they're safe, uh, not that they go to jail. Uh, and so that's why it's two separate things. Protection is not prosecution. It's not related to that at all. In fact, prosecution, again, is simply proof that you failed to protect something properly. Yes. You have said so much that is wonderful. Uh, one thing I really want to highlight is that idea that of, of profit, when people are protected or safe, that there's profit. And I really think that ties into the anarchist community um, and who we are as this new anarchist movement, an anarchi a, a movement of peace. Because one, violence begets violence. Um, and if you are engaging in that violence with the state, if that's how you're meeting the state is through violence, it's destruction. It's a, it's a, it's a loss of energy, a loss of life, a loss of resources. And then everybody, everybody suffers because of it. So what we are trying to do is create pathways forward so that we don't have to be engaged in this. So I really love how you tied that into just on the, like on the macro uh, rather the micro level level, how you create an atmosphere where people can really thrive. Um, and you saw a need in your community and you went out there and met it doing exactly that. Um, and that's really interesting. Sure. So do you feel like this is something anyone could do? Like how, how did you, how, like, you saw a need, you went out there, but, but like, do you have training? Be you, right? Yeah. I'm not a Kung so, Fu master. Yeah, so we're training, training civilians and police. Uh, specifically, we train on is not to kill people. We call it the anti-kill philosophy. That means to find a way to preserve life under all conditions. Mm -hmm. So when people try to stab me, when people tried to kill me, when they shot at me, I was able to find ways to save their life. I didn't have to. I could legally uh, escalate, as I did back in the old days in the 90s. But I found ways because I, I found it beneficial for everyone. I looked at it like this. If we're showing kids, uh, specifically young minds, that violence is the key, how can we tell them later not to do that? How can we tell them that violence wasn't the key, even though it was legal? Uh, why, why is that okay? And it isn't okay. Just because you can legally do something to your neighbor doesn't mean you should. Uh, the people that are going to normally rape, rob, and kill you are people that know you best. That's your family, friends, and neighbors. Uh, so stranger danger is minimal. So what we teach a lot about is about psychology, understanding how to understand yourself, understand the world around you, understand people, and understanding how to read situations so you can create the best possible outcome. 
And that means that you have to have a higher degree of intellectual capacity. You have to have the intellect, the ingenuity, and initiative to create positive change. It's right. complex. It is not easy. It is not simple. I've broken it down into very practical uh, ways of, of learning. But understand that uh, if we're going to be dealing with the apex predator on this planet, then we're going to have to have a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill. Yeah. Uh, and that means we have to take it seriously. Uh, you know, when you say to someone, go be nice and don't be violent, that sounds good. Uh, go have a conversation with someone. Really? That sounds great. Now you're sitting there and the person has their hand in their pockets, they have a gun or a knife, or they have their hands not in their hands or pockets, they have a gun or a knife. Now, how are you supposed to not have fear if you're a logical, intelligent person? How are you going to not have fear of that? Well, you'd have to have the knowledge. You'd have to have the training to not fear the knife, to not fear the gun by understanding biomechanics. Right. Once you understand and biomechanics, you also know how to create a psychological bridge. That's what we call our system, the bridge. It's understanding that, yes, we have violence. Yes, we have people that are violent in violent situations, but there has to be a way of creating a path towards a nonviolent outcome still. There's no imperative to kill people. There's no imperative to use violence. That is not true. We can show you how to do that, and this is what we do. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or yeah. many, many years. We protect communities in Detroit, open communities to the street. We deal with homeless people, armed people. We deal with all kinds of people. Uh, and I created a system so you can manage that, that situation, even in Detroit, without killing people. So it's real. So I have a question for you, do, because this is a big thing in my mind. I grew up in New York City, in Brooklyn, and uh, I, none of the police officers looked like me. I didn't, know, I didn't know any of them. I remember being on my stairs once and having the police come to uh, me and a group of kids that were, we were right on my stairs outside of my house and, you know, pat us down. And, and it was... You, you know, as a kid, it was a real violation, but, and, and I didn't even know how much of a violation it was when I was a kid. Um, I look back on it now and go, I can't believe that I was subjected to that because, you know, it teaches you that you don't own yourself and that, you know, like this, these people can just come in. But I think that started a relationship with police officers as seeing them not as the protectors, but mm -hmm. you know, seeing them as someone that I have to be scared of, which I think is a really interesting dynamic. But I think a large part of that is because these people were strangers. They were not <laughs> interested in the community. Is that yeah. like? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Now, uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's 95, 98% European American. There are African Americans there, but it's very few. Um, and, uh, the police officers were, I would say 99%, uh, European American. Um, and, uh, I never saw them act unprofessionally, not one time, uh, as a kid, as an adult, I saw, I experienced a inappropriate response to an inappropriate movement I made while, <laughs> while being, um, interacted with. Uh, but that's one situation. I moved to Detroit and, um, Nine out of 10 police officers are African-American. Um, and uh, I have never seen such disrespect towards African-Americans by a group of people in my life. Um, and the worst thing you could ever have is someone who grew up in, say, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but um, sometimes when you're experiencing uh, your life and then you grow up that way, you think the world is that way. So <laughs> imagine if... Uh, the police officers in Detroit were kids and they were disrespected. Now they believe that's the way they're supposed to treat people. It's their turn. Uh, and I, I do a lot of training with police officers over the past 25 years. And if you knew the turmoil they're do, that they're dealing with inside of their um, uh, departments, you realize that uh, they have some, there's some severe and significant issues we never hear about. Um, but there's some good officers out there. We, uh, the officers are community oriented. Uh, that, that are that really join the police department to support their communities, that, that really love people and protect people. Um, those officers are the ones that we particularly connect with. They connect with us. Uh, they're community oriented. They, um, they, they looked out for us the whole time uh, throughout all these years because they realize that supporting us supports their families. And their families live in the community. Um, when you have people that grew up in an area and they live there, 
that sounds, you know, romantic. Like, oh, it's where you grew up. That well, try working where you grow up, grow up where you work, live where you work. Try that for a second. Just think about it for a minute. Oh, no matter where you work, think about that's your house. And now you got people, employees, and people coming in your home where you live. That's going to be weird in and of itself. Even though it sounded romantic when you said it, like, I would like people um, to look like me that mm-hmm. are abusing me. <laughs> Why would you want someone to look like you to abuse you? Or do you, do you think it would change if their skin color was different? African-Americans owned uh, plantations and had African-American slaves during slavery. So the reality is skin color was never really a thing. Uh, in Germany and World War One, World War II, no one cared about skin color. Uh, so we need to let that go and move on to humanity uh, as a whole and humanitarianism and looking at the, the human realities. And that's my point is that you really can't have protection as long as we're looking at skin color or, you know, ethnicity, uh, nationalism, looking at any of those aspects of human definition. We can't really uh, come together as humans. And I have a, I have a multicultural staff. I have Christians, Muslims, uh, atheists um, like myself, all working together with um, all different types of religions since day one. We're like Star Trek. I I did like Star Trek. So maybe I recreated that. But the point is (laughs) that, uh, you know, you you have to you have to embrace all people. And it doesn't matter if they're uh, um, a different religion you don't agree with or anything. You love the fact that they're human and you're going to protect them the way you would your own family. And you can't we really can't do that. As long as we're using um, these false uh, separating factors like skin melanin or lack of melanin, or <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. So let we me, just, you know, it, 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 yeah. Let me jump in there because I, I I said that, but it, it, that really wasn't the point actually I, that I was trying to make. Even that is the parent. That is the point I made. But it, it really had more to do with these people, whether they look like me or not, but these people come from yeah. a different community. They don't understand my culture. And I think that can be a problem if you live separate and you really don't understand the kids on the corner with the baggy pants and you see them as like some sort of prim- criminal archetype when it's really just the kid on the corner. Right? You know, And so I think there can be some confusion when the wor- when worlds are so separate um, and there's a lot of stereotyping. So definitely, I don't think about race. No, no, your, your, point, your point is very valid. And I thought the same way on a, on a very rudimentary level. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's just like uh, when people think about homeschooling, but they never did it, right? <laughs> they're just like, oh, well, that doesn't sound, sound right to be at home schooling. But if you understand, like, what it really means about culturing your kids and being in charge of that and how you can actually, you know, <laughs> Uh, make sure things the way that you think they should be versus someone else interjecting their feelings on your family, uh, including other kids. So, it, you, you know, you have to, and this is what happened to me. I, I had to rethink everything because my thoughts were, you know, very surface and it's not, it's very logical, right? But the reality is things are not logical. Um, for example, I would have thought women who were abused by men would be nice to women who were abused by men. And I can tell you, after working at shelters for 20 years, women who are abused by men who then go to work at shelters where women are abused are some of the meanest women I have ever seen. Not Mm -hmm. understanding, not very nice, okay? Not Mm -hmm. good advocates. But I thought they would be, logically, right? If I've been abused, you've been abused. You know, it just makes sense. It's not true, though. And I don't know why it is exactly, but I think it has to do with the psychological fact that you're reminding them of them before they made the decision to be strong or before the uh, apex happened and they became a different person. So they look at you as a weak woman or weak child, or they don't like kids now, or there's all different types of, uh, of psychological perspectives that I witnessed over the years at many different shelters. But it didn't make sense to me because I really thought a woman who had been abused would be very understanding of other women who were abused. And it's not true. Just like I would have thought if you were an African-American during slavery and you got free, you would help others. No, they actually own them and when they went back to uh create liberia the african americans enslaved the africans in africa and it turns out that africans still have slavery right now in mauritania and mali so why is that important because socially our social structures have been uh uh programmed and demented by a eurocentric thought process that is affecting all of us adversely and if we're going to have safety the first thing we have to do is rethink of all humans as family and not let 
things like skin or religion or any of those things enter into it because it's not as no actual real place and it will destroy your ability to uh, create the, the type of community and corporation that you want uh, when we allow those things we've all been programmed to believe to interact in our decision making and I had to do that myself I that's what I'm saying like I had to rethink all these thought processes um, I thought if you help poor people that they would love it right give them a bunch of money and then the poor people would be so happy about having a bunch of money that they will then do good things. And that's not true. And I thought rich people um, wouldn't steal money because they're rich, right? And I thought poor people would steal money because they're poor. And guess what I found out? The big thieves of the rich people and the poor people are much less uh, theft oriented. But that's not what I was told. I grew up in an upper middle class community, middle class, upper middle class. When I came to Detroit, I was told the inner city African Americans are the problem. They are the, they're the, they're the, you know, they're the ones destroying Detroit. They're destroying the fabric. They're, 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 they're destroying it. Let me tell you something. You've never seen so many entrepreneurs in your life. This is the greatest uh, uh, anarchist community in history. Come here right now. All you see is entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, African-American males and females that own boats, yachts, uh, um, and all these different things that don't get into the media. And that's because... No one's celebrating entrepreneurship here. Mm. No one's celebrating uh, the reality of resilience of Americans that fought against system uh, and, and see it by self-educating. Uh, and so my point is that uh, anarchy in its actual definition uh, is alive and well here. And the government that tried to block the uh, success of the individual, it didn't work. They kept winning. And if you come here now, you'll see that they're, they're still winning. But now if you look at the media narrative, it's all here, there's zombies everywhere. It's like, if you come here right now, there should be zombies in the streets and uh, death and murder, and it's not like that. So remember the media is selling this false narratives. We're being programmed to believe all these false things. Uh, the European American police officer is not the problem. Uh, and, and the African American police officer is not the solution. Uh, if you want to uh, make things better, it's like saying a, a European American teacher or African American teacher, is the problem. It's not that. It's the formula. It's the formula. If I'm teaching you that someone sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and that's not true, that's me being a liar. Right. <laughs> if I'm telling you to worship <laughs> and you never even came to the United States or America, then I'm still lying as an educator. And so my point is, it doesn't matter what my skin color is, but I lied to you about uh, some uh, craziness about our history of, of, uh, of our world. And my point is that if we're going to have a better world in the future, we have to build it on truth. Yeah. And that requires us to rethink all the lies. I think, I think you have just actually shifted my perspective on this because, one, because I think you're probably right in that people, you think that the people surrounding you or who, you know, have a common experience to you would be better, but it's probably not true. But I also think that that would be a limited focus. Like even if it were true, it would still be a tribal focus. It wouldn't be getting at the heart Agreed. of how we all become people. And it doesn't matter Agreed. if you come from the suburbs or rural or whatever, you really should be, I think this is what you're saying, you really should be focusing on how you communicate and the principles. So yeah, I, yeah, you shifted, yes. you shifted me over <laughs> to another perspective of that. I thank you for that. That's why we do these conversations. Yes. Smarter. If you don't shift, it, <laughs> don't shift me, my outcome and my income are related. So I don't say things right and do things right. I don't have any ability to function. So that's what I love about, um, uh, sweat equity is that you have to create the positive outcome. You want a positive outcome. No one's going to do it for you. And if my thinking and my actions are inappropriate, so is my income. Uh, so if you tell your outcome and your income are related, truth is uh, definitely something you're going to need to, to, to live by. Yeah, for sure. So I, we're coming up on the hour and I just want to one uh, invite anyone who has a question and I, I'm going to have some questions for you too, especially about how to like really practically implement some of these things when you're out there in the world and someone's coming at you with violence. But I just want to note like anyone who has a question or a comment, you want to hear a story, whatever it is, put it in the chat, raise your hand and we will definitely get to you. David, like David, I know, you know, 
a lot of the reason that Dale Brown is even here is because you recognize how awesome everything he's doing is. And so I know you you guys have been connected for about the past five years, so you know a lot about what he's doing. I definitely want you to chime in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so grateful that he's demonstrated this model. And for me, it was seeing these cops kill innocent black and white and all different types of color people on video and nothing happens to him. You know, this goes back to the Rodney King, I think it was 92 or 93. And those five officers got acquitted. And so it starts to compound, you know, after a while, you're like, what is going on? And there's so many lessons that you're speaking about, Dale. And one is preventing threats before they occur. One is a new paradigm on seeing each other as your family. You know, when I was out there visiting with you and if we talk, you have the anti-kill philosophy. And I'm like, what a great idea you know like treat you like my brother even if you're drunk or you're on drugs or you're you know, wielding a gun if you're my brother i'm not going to come up you know guns blazing and then there's going to be dead bodies as you mentioned it's righteous it's morally defensible but who wants to have a dead body and now that 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 guy's family doesn't have him any longer and one of the things you mentioned oh, to me yeah i mentioned that they're all angry when you kill their family they're never going to be okay with that just so you know, right. that TV show, uh, uh, pissing off Americans, um, <laughs> is probably not your best interest. Killing their family members legally is also not something Americans like to uh, have happen to their family. So when you do something, remember, there's going to be a response, which we usually call um, uh, either uh, accident or um, in, in urban communities, they call it um, uh, senseless violence, you know, revenge uh, <laughs> or justice. And in the rural communities, the Hatfields and McCoys, they make movies about them. Uh, so the, the, the reality is this, though, on a larger scale, on a much larger scale, uh, I went to Hurricane Katrina. There were no law enforcement officers. There was no law. And what I can tell you is uh, it was the worst, um, not just feeling, it was the worst human experience that could ever be had. Uh, and so this is the reality of having no mechanism for public safety to be provided to the public. Uh, and we, there's obviously no money under uh, a life and death condition. So you can't say I'll do it for money. And that's something I want to say that whenever we talk about protection, you can never bring up money. Money is the byproduct is what I said. You can never make it your purpose. People always look at our organization. Oh, they have these um, Hummers and boats and other. Okay, that doesn't matter at all because none of that would be possible if the outcome wasn't what it was. And I could never have the outcome if I was thinking about buying things. There's no way you can have a positive outcome in a life and death struggle, even considering uh, a future of spending money. Okay? You, you, it's not psychologically appropriate. And so my point in saying that is this, that we need to think about uh, the reality of protection. It's not work. You cannot protect as work. Protect is an act of love, and love has nothing to do with money. So you have to think about what this is really about. When you go to protect your child, you're not thinking about the money they're going to earn when they get older, the money they're going to use to take care of you when they get older. You're not thinking about money at all. You're thinking, I'm going to protect my child. I'd never rather die than let my child suffer uh, at the hands of this situation or person. And that's love. And that's what protection is. And anything else is a bastardized version of protection. It's not real. And so you have to love people and you can't think about money when it comes to protection. When I went to protect people in the, in the inner city here in Detroit, uh, in the east side of Detroit, these are poor people. I have nothing in common with. I don't know them. They're not my friends or family, okay? <laughs> they didn't know me. I don't know them. And I, I had to put my life at risk for them as humans, as people. And some of them were people that didn't even like me, okay? So I still had to put my life at risk for them and their family, even though they did not like me and do it for free, no money. Because at the end of the day, I don't want them to die. And if they die, it negatively affects, negatively affects other people. And so the love of people supersedes your love of yourself. And that's where protection is separate from, say, you know, fixing food or ride sharing. Or, and that's the thing that to, to remember that, that you can't use the, the ideological concept of money and profit as the reason for protection. So the worst people you can ever use for protection would be um, uh, people like uh, uh, mercenaries. Because a mercenary is doing something for money. And it, it sounds, you know, sexy, sounds good. I'm going to use this, my gun, I'm going to go protect people for money. It, until you do, you realize there's a probability of death. 
That's why they don't show that when you join the military. They don't show that you could die because otherwise you'll start thinking, well, how am I going to go to college with this college money if I'm dead? So what happens with, with a person who's thinking about protection for money, they're thinking they're going to be able to spend that money. The moment their brain believes there's no way I'm going to make it, there's even 50% likelihood I won't make it to spend the money. They're not going to go protect that person, that place, or that thing. So you have to find people that love the persons that they're protecting more than they love themselves. You have to put yourself at risk for others for no money. There's not going to be any money. You're literally going to be able to be killed for protecting this person. So and so that's I, where we got to. Yeah, I imagine that on the, the mean streets of Detroit, you've had to put yourself into those kinds of positions, probably a lot. And in the country, uh, and in the country towns. Absolutely. Uh, the yeah, towns there's crime and crazy people and, yes. and violent people everywhere. So can you share with us like a, like a real world example of how you interacted with someone maybe who had a gun? That's a scary situation. I'm not sure how I would deal with that. Um, you never yeah. know how you'll deal with that until you're in the situation, I suppose. Um, and maybe well, that's what the training is for. But tell us how you dealt yes. with it. Yes. So, so, so first of all, um, uh, I'm from Ann Arbor, so when I'm growing up, I didn't know anyone who got killed. So I, I watched, I watched Batman, and I think I thought I was one of those characters. So when I came to Detroit, and I was like, "Okay, we're gonna protect people. Let's go protect the community. Let's go, people." They were like, uh, "I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what you mean, like, like go out in the street, man? You better call the police. <laughs> These guys are not trying to die. I didn't know you could die. I had no idea you could actually die. These kids here." grew up in a place that's completely unprotected. Let's be clear about the words uh, that you hear in the news and mainstream media and mainstream life here in America. They call them at-risk communities. What they're at risk of is not being protected. That's risk. What I did was add protection. That's all. I simply protected them. It's not rocket science. I just put myself between the predator and their prey, and I was consistent, and that changed the behavior. Uh, it turns out predators, by the way, are also cowards. I was there to die for protection of people. I had nothing. I had no future, no nothing, okay? They were there to exploit the weaknesses of other humans, which requires you to pick the right humans. Remember, if you get, uh, if you pick the wrong human, you could be killed. So predators are very careful to pick proper prey. All I had to do is convince them we're not a good prey animal. So if you'd like to continue being a predator, you will need to go somewhere else. And that's the science we use right now. Predators stay away from us. They, we don't have any. People don't even argue with us. Uh, we call them thug animals. Thug animals are not criminals. Criminals are people you give them the car keys. They will simply drive away. A thug animal is someone who's going to kill you even though you gave them the car keys, even though you gave them the wallet. And then I found out from working with kids in the inner city and working with adults when they were the, as they got older, and I found out that all they are are people that had no nurturing. They had no protection. They had no uh, love that was given to them. And as a result, they're in pain. Those children that grew up in pain are now sharing that pain as adults with other people. They're just pain sharing is what I call it. And as a result, people think of it as economics. It wasn't economics. That's why you got, what, nine out of 10 active shooters are from where? Suburban homes with two parent households. They're not from orphanages. There's not been one person from an orphanage that went and did an active shooting. Not one. They have guns. Orphans have guns. So the reality is when people feel pain, when they feel a sense of disconnection from, from humanity, they act inhumanely. Uh, I've, I've had a chance uh, to be involved in many different, uh, you know, hundreds of situations of violence. Uh, but more importantly, what I'm most proud of is the people I was able to train, both law enforcement and civilians, to manage these issues and to not do it violently in, mo in nine out of 10 situations. So if you go to our website, threatmanagementcenter.com, threatmanagementcenter.com, you will see testimonials by police officers uh, that have used the training to not injure people and made decisions to, to, to use a tactic, a technique that resulted in no injury when they could have legally used force and violence. They found a way to use our technique not to do that. Uh, and so police officers are able to subjugate someone without hurting them. Uh, more importantly, on a much larger scale, 
civilians have now coming back to me over the past 25 years with great stories of how the training saved their lives, how it prevented them from being abused and yeah. attacked both domestic and uh, in actual uh, force on force conflicts in street scenarios. Uh, I was in a situation here, but well, maybe a hundred yards from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, uh, people called in about a woman screaming, being uh, attacked in a car. She gets out of the car, fighting her way out, screaming. She's being punched in the face repeatedly. She's being choked and punched. She's fighting for her life. Uh, the people in the homes are, are, are all concerned. They all start calling 911 and calling us. I make sure they call 911 first. I go there. When I get there, I see nothing but a car on a public street. I don't see any people. And I just drive and I turn around. As I'm driving back, the guy pops up. He had the woman in the back seat on the floorboard choking her out. When I pulled up, he jumps out and he starts to get to the front seat. And there's a video on my uh, Facebook, Detroit Threat Management Center. If you go to Detroit Threat Management on Facebook, you'll see uh, this video. I actually have the video on there. Uh, I get the guy out of the car. I talk to him. I have him back up. I get the girl out and get him in my car and send him on his way. Police did show up. They got there pretty quick, too. They got there in approximately uh, uh, approximately five minutes. And um, I in a matter of two or three minutes. And I was able to solve it because he was about to leave. And I was able to get her out of the car, into my vehicle, and send him away. And some people, you know what they said? They go, why didn't you get the guy? Why didn't you take him down? Why didn't you get the guy? Uh, my objective was to rescue the girl, to rescue the girl, not to go after him. We got his license plate. She, the police can go get him, which they did. They okay. prosecuted him later. He's in prison. Okay? My objective was to get the female victim away from the predator into the car safely. The police yeah. then took her to the So that's an example of real world dealing with violence in the street um, and doing it nonviolently. I don't have to. I mean, we could have taken the guy down. I could have uh, I could have killed the guy legally. But, but I found a way to do what I wanted to do, which is rescue the person. And I all of us can do that. There's nothing we couldn't do that anyone couldn't do. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in having that be your focus. And I think the problem with the police is that it's switched around and that isn't the focus. Um, I want to uh, give Moose an opportunity who's been waiting patiently to uh, comment or, or ha maybe you have a question. Um, so you can unmute yourself, Moose. And then I have a question from Brindle that I'll try to put to you as well. Oh, <clears throat> Moose, uh, back this week, Moose. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, nice to see everybody again. This is now officially from the farm. Um, but um, uh, it's very interesting. And it's actually reminded me a lot when I grew up because, I mean, I ended up going away, joining the service. And you think this whole protect and serve, that whole mentality of protection. But I also grew up, kind of two things intertwined. Grew up as a kid as a skater punk. So as you can imagine, me in the law, even though I was extremely peaceful, nonviolent person, kind of got me out of a lot of situations, but end up in the back of a police car because I was watching the sunrise kind of situations. But your talk reminds me of that. And then also growing up on the farm, got lots of guns. There's old guns in the house right now. Um, I've only ever shot three deer at one time with a muzzleloader within two minutes of each other. I'm a very good shot. I'm a very well-intentioned shot. But ever since then, I don't shoot. I've taken videos. I help my father with the food like that where you talk about protecting other people and this whole intention and how really there's a nonviolent way coming from the fact that i am a, a marksman or a hunter or i was a skater punk a skate a, a white boy skating over in downtown or wherever it was in philly wherever i went interacting with people peacefully and then also having knowing that i don't want to pull a trigger and being capable these two you're talking kind of reminds me of that and like after then going to the service and then all of it coming back to fruition, realizing, wait, this whole status thing and protection and what does it mean to protect others? And just like the other night, I told my grandma, she wanted me to move her couch a thousand times before she passed. I don't care. I, it's for somebody <laughs> else. Like I'll move it a hundred times for her back and forth, back and forth. But it's, um, I, love, I, love. I really like your talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome, Moose. Thank you. Um, thank you for always chiming in, Moose. It, it's a pleasure to hear your perspective. And um, thank you for feeling 
open enough to share all of that with us. Um, I have a, I have what might be a, a tough question actually from Brindle, and I, but it's a valid question and a relevant question for the anarchist community. Uh, so we we want to be the protectors, and you provide an avenue for people to to gain the skills to be protectors. My question, or really Brindle's question combined with mine, is what happens when the state comes at you with violence? And what is the role of a protector? You know, someone who's gone through your program, maybe, let's say if CPS comes to take away someone's children or if the police come and are hostile, how, how, what's the role of someone who's gone through your program or, um, or what do you what think you do your is role is? Yes, what you do, what we have done is, number one, you create a bridge, okay? The bridge is psychological. Uh, and that means you communicate. So I have uh, been able to communicate with police officers in situations. I've been able to physically uh, stop situations from escalating. I've been able to uh, prevent officers from being injured. And I've more, more often than not prevented people from being injured by police by helping to get some under control before they make a terrible mistake. And that person's now alive. Uh, and so what we can do is remember uh, not to look at people as special based on some type of job, okay? Um, pretend people are people. And what would you say if the man in front of you with a gun had a blue rag sticking out of his pocket or a white hood on his head? Would you say, I will not let you violate my rights, person with the white hood and a burning cross in the background? I would like to not have my rights violated. I'm sure and many lynch victims tried that. Um, not exactly in those words, but I'm sure it didn't work either. So the reality is predation and violence are not related to a job or title or position, even if we think it is. And to find out, all you have to do is go drive around. You can simply go to, um, like, for example, I've been shot at many times, never by police, always by people in the inner city. And every single person that shot at me has the same skin color I have. Uh, and, um, six of my staff members have been shot. Um, uh, two of my members that were shot are, uh, European Americans, one's from Canada and he was protecting people here in America, uh, helping families stay alive and safe when he was shot. And none of my people are dead because we, we train to keep them alive. We stabilize our wounded and transport to level one trauma hospitals, which all of us can do as civilians. Everyone with training can protect their lives. And, uh, you don't need permission to protect anyone's life. Let's be clear about that, too. Somehow, we, from, from our indoctrination, um, we believe, and this was when I first started, um, citizens would say to me, inner city citizens would say to me, urban citizens would say, hey, who gave you permission to protect these people? And I would say, what do you mean? Who gave you permission to do this? Do they know you're doing this? But like, first of all, who is they? Who is they? <laughs> They're like, the man, those people. I was like, I don't know what to know, but I know that I'm going to make sure these families are safe. Then the police officers would would uh, come to the situation and they would say, um, you know, uh, uh, we don't like what you're doing. And I would say, I understand, but I'm an American, not American. And if there's any questions, they'll kind of answer them. The police administration supported us. And the reason the police administration supported us is because the outcomes were positive because there are no complaints, because there was no use of forcing violence on innocent people and, and unarmed people and, and nonviolent people. So as a result of that, no court dates and no negative feedback, the police department was very happy. The administrators supported us and have always supported us because we create positive, peaceful environments. That being said, when there has been situations where um, police officers are not protective or are inappropriate, um, what I try to do and what we have done in many cases is been able to communicate with the officers and the civilian to create non adversarial nonviolent outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. And that takes, uh, there's actually part of my Facebook, you'll see uh, there's a, a manager from DTE, a guy probably makes 80000 a year, uh, uh, usually very articulate, college graduate. He had a medical response to um, some drugs, one from a dentist and one from working out, some type of drug interaction and it caused him to lose his mind. He's 14 inch knife, swinging at cars. He lives in a gated community that we protect. He's uh, 30 years old, drives a brand new foreign car, uh, lives a really good life. 
And uh, his parents are very happy that we did not use the law to kill him. Uh, nor did we create conditions for police officers that responded to shoot him. We got him to put the knife down. We talked to him. Uh, even though he wanted to fight, even though he's being aggressive with us, uh, we were able to de-escalate him uh, by ignoring his inappropriate touching. And uh, we uh, talked him down and got him into police custody without any violence, without any issue. So here's a guy swinging a blade uh, at cars, uh, randomly going crazy, and we get him into custody without even punching him. Cutting. All that violence, is, I swear to you, it's not necessary. Uh, and, and so they go, all those TV shows you saw, all the movies, all the inculcated violence, it was all wrong. And you're talking to someone who believed in it wholeheartedly. I, I grew up around, I started shooting AR, uh, M16A1s in uh, the 70s. My mother was a lieutenant in the Army. She was a firearms instructor. She was a firearms competitor. And she taught me how to use the uh, M16. Back then, the laws were not as tight as they are now. You take your kids to the gun range, the military. But my point saying that is this, uh, martial arts, I started as a kid, guns, it was part of my life. I became a firearms instructor, five disciplines, an NRA firearms instructor. And when, when they gave money to Trayvon Moss, killer, I immediately canceled all of my uh, instructorships. Um, and that's because we're supposed to, people who, who carry guns, uh, anyone who does carry guns, supposed to not shoot unarmed children. Uh, if I got beat up by a kid out here, uh, and I'm out here right now in Detroit, if some kid uh, beats me up, um, I, I'm not going to shoot him, no matter what. In fact, if an adult beats me up, I'm not going to shoot them either. Um, and yeah. guess what? If you're a hockey player and you punch a lot of face, you're not going to shoot the other hockey player. Uh, it's just how it goes. And, and we should be uh, that kind of people yeah. that can take a punch anyway, but especially from a kid. But the yeah. point is that <laughs> peace starts with uh, the perspective that, you know, you don't want violence and the, the, you have to say to yourself, I don't want it. And then that's the path to believing it. So what you believe affects what you conceive, which ultimately affects what you achieve. But it starts in that order. Believe, conceive, achieve. Yeah. Forbearance is the greater part of wisdom. And I really appreciate that perspective. I really appreciate the perspective that, yeah, I got hit, but that doesn't mean it's okay to kill them. Like as a, uh, you know, especially as a trained professional, as a trained professional, your job should not be to look for the reason. Absolutely. Agreed. Uh -huh. Absolutely. The big, even bigger point. Yes. And I, 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 a guy tried to stab me to death uh, and, um, and <laughs> in uh, the 90s. And I saw him again in 2010 at a gas station after he got out of prison for some other crime. I could not get him prosecuted. And I tried to get him prosecuted. Um, but uh, we, for whatever reason, even though he stabbed someone in the throat and blood was shoot out of this, the guy's throat, uh, and um, I, uh, I could have shot him when he came towards me with a knife, said I decided to take him down and not hurt him. I was very proud because I thought he was going to get prosecuted. And as a result, uh, he didn't get prosecuted for whatever reason. And um, I didn't see him for 15 years. And then one day at the gas station, he said, hey, um, uh, you know, let me, you got some change or something, right? And I say, hey, man, uh, how, you, how you doing? He looked at me, he goes, I don't know you. I said, come on, man, it's me. He was like, never seen you before in my life. So I'll give you $5 if you take a picture with me and, 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 and uh, shake my hand. He was like, $5? I was like, yes, $5. He was like, man, how you been doing? <laughs> oh, I give five dollars to take with me. And that's after a guy tried to stab me and gut me um, east side. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, you know, another guy shot at me uh, on the east side. I saw him again, uh, like, to be 17 years later. Uh, same thing with a casual conversation, and he brought it up. And I recognized him right off. Um, he was trespassing in a building, but I hadn't seen him for 17 years. Last time I saw him, he was two streets away from where we're now, on the east side of Detroit, shooting at me uh, from in a darkened area. And um, the uh, police responded. And um, they turned out they were looking for this guy because he had killed an entire family. 17 years later, I come across the same guy. I don't know, crack um, makes you uh, 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 apparently very resilient because he looked exactly the same. He had an age of death. <laughs> I got much older. <laughs> and, uh, don't be crack. He was on a crack diet. Uh, he gained no weight. He could run really fast. <laughs> anyway, 
I talked to him. I was like, I was like, hey, sir, you know, sorry, you can't be in his basement. And I recognized him, and, and he's about five feet away from me, which is not a good disarming distance, right? And so as I, you know, kind of got out of the way to get on his side, and, and we call it join, mirror, and placate to get him to, you know, walk out. He was like, okay, I'll get my stuff. And um, as we're walking out, he goes, you know, you look real familiar. Did you used to work here about 17 years ago? I was like, well, yeah. And I said, uh, I thought that was you. He goes, yeah, man. I said, I thought you went to prison. He goes, no, nope, no, nope. I've been out here the whole time. This guy was one of killing a family. The guy shot at me repeatedly, like uh, eight rounds from a 45. Uh, and he did it on two different occasions. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's fine. <laughs> but he left without incident because I didn't escalate him. Not yeah. because he's not, because right. I, I could have escalated. I could have tackled him. I could have shot him. I There's lots of options. I didn't want violence. And guess what? He didn't want that either. So he simply took the path of least resistance. Yeah. Uh, and that note, let me say this, the guy, uh, this guy in particular, uh, the reason why he shot at me is I was chasing him. The reason I was chasing him is because the last time before I was chasing him uh, and, my, and I had a pit bull with me um, that wouldn't bite. It was a nonviolent pit bull, unfortunately. <laughs> And um, so, make my story short, uh, I saw this guy, it's wintertime in Michigan, he has a black mask on, but there's two other guys with him, and I'm thinking I'm being paranoid, because, you know, it's, I, I, I'm just thinking that maybe these are bad guys, but then I thought, you know what, it's not bad guys, it's just regular guys. So, one guy starts running towards me, and I was like, he's not running towards me, I'm just being paranoid. And all of a sudden, I hear thunder, and him shooting a 45, I look in my rearview mirror, he is unloading on my vehicle, I feel thuds right under my seat. I take a right, go right to the police station. When I get to the police station, I, I had just left the police station. I came back. I said, I just got shot at. Um, a female officer goes outside with a smirk on her face like, why would they shoot at you? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. This guy, I, he had a mask on. I don't even know who it was. Uh, it turns out um, he, thought, he knew that I was uh, not allowing him into buildings to harass single moms. So he was going to kill me. That, that's it. <laughs> and, um, I, I imagine and, I imagine you know. the, the officer went under my car to look for these bullet holes she comes back she goes I can't write the report that there was bullet holes I said well okay I don't, I'm not I'm, your lack of ability to see bullet holes is not my problem so I go to get the exhaust change six months later and uh, the uh, exhaust changing people they saw bullet holes just fine okay yeah. so <laughs> well she's not the mechanic <laughs> yeah the, the mechanic he knows bullet holes he was like, oh, what are these big bullet holes out here? I was like, what? So you can see them, but this uh, officer couldn't see these big, giant bullet holes. Uh, so the reality is, though, violence is literally a choice. Yeah. Um, and, and you can create conditions to de-escalate. De-escalatory uh, um, projection starts with voice inflection, facial expressions. It's not about waiting for violence. By the time violence happens, you've already screwed up a lot of threat management. Preventive threat management starts at looking at people in a car down the street that are looking at you. You don't wait for them to get to you. You're already managing threats ahead of time. You're changing your time, your method, your route, your method of travel. Your, those are things that you do to harden your target. There's all these things that you do that makes it so you cannot be taken advantage of by a predator. And that's what we teach specifically. Psychology, law, skill. So that's, so yeah, that's, that's going to, what uh, somebody on the, the thread asked the question, actually, before I get to that question, Ace and Deb, I'm going to get to that question, um, or it'll be part of this question. So the question is first for David, but then for you, David, you've been listening to Dale Brown for five or six years or something like that. And I'm really curious to know, like, what because obviously he resonated with you. What he was saying resonated with you. I'm really curious to know, like, what was the central, most important thing you took away from him in terms of how we can protect ourselves or how we can um, how we can confront violence. And then for you, Dale, the question is kind of similar, but really just like in just a few words and like really practical. If I lose all access to the internet and I end up in like the jungle somewhere, uh, you just like two, two parts. What, what's the most important mentally for me to know, like 
And then the most important physically, like what are the things I could do? So you can think on that while well, David, I, I want to hear what your experience has been. Yeah, it's a great question. The first thing is that his philosophy is based on prevention rather than coming after the fact. So he creates conditions where threats can't happen. You know, the police, I'm sure there's good guys in the, in the force, but they show up after the violence. So if you set it up, hospitals, schools, communities, where it's impossible or really difficult to be a target, as he mentioned, these are predators. So they look for easy targets. So you make it difficult for them. They say, I'm going to go to some easy mark. And one of the stories that you mentioned before some years ago, Dale, that really like changed my paradigm was this, this guy you talked about who tried to be violent with you 15 years ago and you saw him later and you're still cordial with them. And you said, it's not the guy who's the problem. It's the violence. That's the problem. So we got to distinguish between that human beings were wounded. We've been traumatized. We've gone to school, mass media, indoctrination. There's a lot of things that's going on in our subconscious that we're not even aware of. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's another way to help people. And so the other aspect of it is that the cops, they're not even trained in this art form. You know, maybe they get three months or four months, maybe of training and- yeah, that's less than get someone who does hair styling and fashion and nails. And so I said, they're not even aware of these techniques that uh, Dale's perfected and mastered in the field. And so that's one aspect of it. The other side is police. They will say to you, I have to go back home to my family. What Dale's talking about is I will die for a stranger because I value human life. And this is actually the mindset of a real hero. And this is what just irks me when I see Dexter. people worship, worship these, these cops and these EMTs. And they're all like, I'm sure many of them are like great people, but they're making huge money and they're going to go back to their family and that's on their head. So they're, they're hesitant. But just like in the civil rights movement, when I saw uh, Dick Gregory talk about, you know, his nonviolent protest, he said, we were going out there to be nonviolent with Martin Luther King and we were prepared to die. We didn't want to die but we were at our limits and we were out there to basically show the world we're going to put ourselves out here. If you're going to kill us nonviolently, then you're going to be obviously the predator. And so I love that about Dale's like, no, real heroes, they're not doing it for money. They're not doing it for fame. They actually value human life and they will put themselves at risk. And this is why he did it, I think, for free for the first few years with his dog and, you know, uh, just getting that free floor there. Free. Dave. We do people that can't afford services. We protect them for free. We never protect the rich for free. Not one second. We protect poor people for free. The, never. It's a rule. Never do we ever protect rich people for free. But you know what drives to get free services? Always the rich people. <laughs> always the rich. <laughs> well, here's the other aspect of <laughs> it: is that people, you, the poor people yeah, are always you, trying to like, I have five dollars. I will uh, pay my next paycheck. No, you will not. You will keep your money for your family, for your kids, and and take care of your family. We will not take money from working class people, but when you're rich and we're about to make you healthy and alive, you're going to pay us a great deal of money. We're extremely expensive. The outcome yeah. is, is worth it because being a safe and alive is very important to people that are wealthy. Right. Yeah. And you have these clients that protect their business. They're making hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And so you take that profit and that surplus and you're allowed to help single mothers. And this is on video. If you haven't seen some of the videos on YouTube, this is Sil's video, going and helping this mother with the babies. It's like, how is he able to do that? Because there is enough revenue, and that's his philosophy of the company. So well, this is the new paradigm well, we're talking about it. being – yeah. Mm -hmm. without, without any money, we still – like when I have any money, I still help people for free. So it, right. it has to be – it's like a person things, right? So when you're a singer and you go to join a choir or you get paid to be a wedding singer or you become a professional singer, you need to love singing. That's what makes him a good singer. Uh, and so what makes me a protector is that's who I actually already was. Um, mm. If I wasn't getting paid, I would pay to do this. I would pay for the privilege to protect people. I would mm. do this. If someone would let me pay to do what I do, I would let, I would love to do that. I can't believe they paid me for this. I would do it. I'd pay you to let me. Um, mm. So Because I love going to people's lives and removing a rape, a robbery, and a killing from their life. I love that about what we do. I love the feedback of seeing the families and how happy they are when they come back later with these great stories of how they've had this great life and uh, my staff members helped them. And now it's been thousands of people. So like most people that we've helped, I don't even know them. I never met them. 
So I meet them later, and they're like, uh, one lady said to me, she goes, thank you for my son. I was very nervous. I didn't know what that meant. And she said, um, my son uh, is one years old, and uh, she asked if I remember her. I was like, oh, no, I never remember you. I've never met you day in my life. She goes, well, you saved my son. I was like, what are you talking about? So this lady uh, is a sheriff's deputy. She adopted a child after the mother was killed by the husband, right? Mm. But that child is one that my team member got shot seven times. He wrapped his arms around this baby uh, to protect the baby and get the baby out from the parents as they were pulling the legs and arms. The, mo the mother was trying to pull the baby away. The, the father was pulling the other way. The father later killed the mother. That day we rescued the mother and the baby. Uh, but now the baby has had a great life, adopted by Sheriff's deputy, and living a great life, man. Uh, so those are the kind of stories that, that I'm extremely happy about. We can take people that would normally be, you know, robbed or killed. I wish you could have somehow protected the lady, but we did. That day she was actually naked on the third floor outside of a window. We uh, went to the house, got her in off the ledge. Uh, he said he had an AK-47. He's going to kill us and shoot through the wall. I stayed with him. He then tried to grab the baby. My guy grabs the baby and goes uh, to the front of the building. And that's how we rescued the baby. I had no idea that this woman, the sheriff's deputy, was going to adopt the, the child later after the mother was murdered. Uh, and so imagine, though, if, if we weren't there that day, we would have killed the baby probably that day and the mother. So yeah. it's great. It's great to, to give the feedback. And police officers are on our website, and they're testifying to how they use the training to protect other people's lives as well as their own life. Uh, and we're very proud of that, that they didn't get killed and they didn't use force and violence while protecting themselves and others. In many cases, they were able to talk people down or to subjugate them again without injury. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, when, when we think about uh, the training. Yeah. So I, I just want to a quick time check where, you know, a quarter past the hour, we probably have, um, we're going to try to wrap this up around 7.30. So I want to, uh, Ace and Deb asked a good question, and it really is kind of tied to what I asked you as well, which is, you know, there's like two most important practical things that you can do. One, just on the mental side, if you're confronting violence, but then physically, how to protect yourself. And then Ace and Deb wanted to know if there's an online resource to learn more about these things, how to protect yourself. Um, and so if you could share some information with uh, with us about that. We have probably 600 videos on YouTube. Uh, so you can look there and you'll see not just actual training, but you'll see how it actually worked in real life because we'll, we have media coverage. We've got about 600 videos on there. So you can learn a lot in there, uh, training right from that. Uh, also, you can go to our website, again, threatmanagementcenter.com. Lots of training there. Uh, we are going to be opening franchises. Uh, Dave uh, Rodriguez uh, uh, planted that seed years ago, uh, and, and and we're going to bring that fish. Thanks, Dave. Dave is one who <laughs> got me thinking about that. And I was like, franchise? What? No, we're going to do it. And it's people in New Zealand, people that saw us on um, Vice Land. They saw us on Vice. Uh, last year, HBO uh, did a story about us. Uh, Chris Cuomo came out and interviewed some of our uh uh, victims, CNN came out and they, they videoed our, our victory program. We call it victory. And that's our domestic violence program. It's all free. We've trained the families. We train them. We protect them. We take them to court. We hide them. I take my money. Uh, there's no grants, no, no donations. Uh, and I take my money. My men volunteer their time. Uh, I'm not paying them either. They're just volunteers uh, as, as part of threat management center, which is not the security side of what we do. And they, um, they volunteer these women alive. Now, one woman in 20 years, 25 years, has been injured or killed, uh, or their children, or men. We've protected men from men. There's men that are trying to attack other men, uh, murdered victims. Uh, don't ask me how this works, okay, because it doesn't make sense from watching TV. But murdered, that, people that get murdered, the, the people that did the murdering want to go kill the family members of the people that they murdered, which makes no sense to me. You already killed a lady's son. Little kid, right? She has nothing to do with the story, but anyway, keep them alive. So, yeah, that look, yeah, I had to look. I was, why would you want to kill the guy's mother? You just kill the guy, and they're not related. There's no drugs, there's no, there's no, nothing. 
Uh, and so remember this also, I want to say this real quick, guys. Whenever you see a story, um, <laughs> remember there's multiple sides. Uh, but remember this, that uh, nine out of 10, uh, especially in urban communities, people defend themselves are, are simply called senseless violence. Uh, maybe they call it senseless to defend yourself in an urban community. But the reality is at least 50% of every story you ever heard of has an antagonist and a protagonist, an aggressor and a defender. Even though the news story goes, these two people were shooting. These two people were fighting. These two people, whatever they're saying, these 10 people. But guess what? Someone was a predator and someone was a victim in every single story, 99% of the time. 99%, most people never agreed to go to fight. They never agreed to be equal combatants. So my point in saying that is please remember that when you see something, think of a positive, neutral, and negative reason you see that. That's called the discernment triad. So when you see a woman being held by her throat, for example, against a wall, don't automatically think that this is violence. It could be violence. It looks like violence, but it could also be her teaching self-defense to her boyfriend. This could also be a doctor checking her, her, her throat for a lymph nodes or something. But to you, it would look like he was holding her throat. So if you take an action of violence against this guy holding the one by her throat right off the bat without, without considering that there is a good reason, you will create a false positive. And that is very important for everyone listening today. Always be analytical. Remember to think of a positive, neutral, negative reason. Someone's at your back door. Someone's in your backyard. They could be looking for their dog. This happens all the time. Uh, someone's sitting in a car. I have people that call me. Uh, I do a re-education on the phone. I get calls from people. They're like, what are, you, what are you security people doing? There was someone sitting in front of our house, uh, my neighbor's house, for an hour, sitting there. And when I they took off, and I started following, and they just ran out of the neighborhood. Then I get another call that says, what is security doing? Someone just chased my dog from the street, from away from our house. So their paranoia and fear caused them to take an action and then caused a reaction. So you actually are creating violence from fear, which you can't not do that unless you have fear management, which comes from what we created, preventive threat management. So this is why the training is there, to prevent you from going on a fear-based path and taking a fear-based uh, response to stimulus. And that's normal. We use fear to dictate actions rather than yeah. facts. Remember, right? It I will think, destroy facts. Always, always use facts, never, never fear. Yeah. I think that's probably the like number one <laughs> sort of like mental, emotional, like guideline or like the most important thing for you to do is just not make a fear based, um, uh, have a fear based reaction. Um, physically though, and if you could keep this brief, we have one more question I want to make sure we get to before we wrap things up. Um, physically though, what do I do? I'm five one, <laughs> tiny. What What do I do? How do I protect myself? Uh, first of all, you don't think of protection as anything to do with size uh, or guns. Remember that every dead police officer, soldier, and many criminals all died with guns. Mm -hmm. So if the gun was going to keep you alive, I personally know a police officer who was dead, uh, who bench pressed 650 pounds. And he was killed by a guy who couldn't bench press 150 pounds. Um, so... I promise you that is not going to, uh, you know, help you. What helps you is your thought process, uh, being able to outthink situations. The smartest person in the situation will always win. And the, the most important thing to do is to not uh, let an adversarial condition exist. So if you think, well, how do I protect myself? Use your cunning, use your intellect, your ingenuity initiative to create a non-adversarial interaction for a non-adversarial outcome. Yeah. That's a great thing to do. Join Mirror Play Cake. When a guy says, hey, the Illuminati's watching me. Hey, they're on me. They're, uh, are you with the Illuminati? Like, you, you, you don't sit there and get angry with them. You start agreeing with them. The Illuminati's a problem. I agree with you. Let's get out of here before the Illuminati gets us. Now you just move the guy away. He thinks you're his friend, and you stop having any type of violence with the guy. Absolutely. Or you could say, you're crazy. Get away from me, Illuminati person. And now you're going to have violence, right? Because you're in an adversarial conversation, which yeah. is going to lead to violence. So the greatest thing I can tell you is this. Uh, no matter who's carrying the gun, the best thing to do is to get along with them as best you can. Whether you have a gun or not, remember every – and now I've, I've trained multiple police officers and worked with multiple police officers that are dead, and they were doing a good service at the time of their death. They were actually protecting people. Yeah. So the reason is the gun did not – this is in Detroit. So the gun does not save you. 
What saves you is a better level of training. And I'm working with uh, um, a defensive tactics instructor in Detroit, uh, in the police academy, that's actually training with us to take that training into the academy to help uh, officers make that transition. Uh, and what it is, the psychological transition to a protector, uh, uh, police as a protector, okay? And, and de-emphasizing prosecution and emphasizing protection as a philosophy. Yeah, I, I mean... Yeah, I, I have so many more questions. Hopefully we'll get to do this again because I feel like there's a lot of other avenues to go down. Uh, Michael, I wanna give you a chance to be uh, to briefly ask a question and uh, for Dale to briefly answer that question. And we want to, we're probably gonna think, start to wrap things up. We wanna be respectful of all of the staff who comes together to put this together and be here every week for you. Um, Michael. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, it's good to see you every week. Hello, everybody. And uh, it's a real, real pleasure to see you, Dale. And uh, man, you, you really, uh, you know, you, you're, you're just an amazing man. Your, your courage, you know, your mindset, the, the way that you've, uh, you know, arrived at the solutions you have. I'm just, uh, you know, so grateful that you're coming down to uh, Anarchapoco this year, because it's Thank something you. we've We've been wanting for a while, and uh, you know I'm so thankful. Now you've got a workshop going on this this week. Could you talk a little bit about that, or when you come down? And then also, uh, what about uh, kind of franchising that to like a place like Acapulco? Absolutely. Yes. So we have uh, right now we have people that are flying in from other cities, states, and countries. They're coming in. They come in for the weekend, uh, and they train. With us. They go out in the field. They actually get trained with the team members out in the field. They do ride-alongs with us. Uh, they see how we interact with the public. They see the public really likes us being there because they know we're there to protect them. Uh, they also get a chance to experience actual tactical training and, and of course, the actual living example of the philosophy of love and protection. Uh, and then we're going to be bringing it to uh, Acapulco and other places. Every place there's people that need to have this training, universities, schools, we don't need to go down the fear-based path. We need to go down the peaceful path, and everyone's going to prosper as a result. Uh, and, and that's a natural byproduct. When I say prosper, I don't mean just financially. I mean, when you don't have violence in your school, uh, when you don't have violence in your um, hospital, <laughs> you're able to create a better, uh, more harmonious environment and your corporation, your community. And that's really what we want to do. And I think uh, once people see that it's a real thing, I mean, we're doing it here in Detroit. You can check crimemapping.com and you'll see these white spaces without any crimes in them. That's our areas that we're working. And that's because, it's not because we're arresting people, it's because we don't let criminals into the community to harm the people. And guess what? When we're driving down the street, and there's also, you'll see on Facebook, uh, one where um, my wife called over because she saw a vehicle up on the uh, curb and there were bullets in this vehicle and on the ground. So I pull over and give him first aid. Uh, I'm not being paid for that. There's no money. I'm, I'm now uh, saving this man's life because he is about to die. And that's what we all should be doing is protecting everyone. It has nothing to do with money. Again, money's back box. And what you'll see is you'll just have a better uh, quality of life when property value increases and there's no arrests, no robberies, uh, no killing. Um, and, uh, you know, again, what, what this does is, if you think from, from a larger perspective, the training means that wherever you are, in whatever country, you have these people that are trained, regular people, first contactors is what I call it, not first responders. First responders are the police and ambulance and medic and, and fire. Uh, first contactors are the people that are ones that are call the police. That's you and me, the regular people. I call the police before we take any action. We always call 911. And the reason why you always want to call police is so you can prove that you wanted legal intervention. And the only reason you took action, if you had to take action, was there was an accident circumstance that required you to take an action. You're not being a vigilante. Very important that you create conditions for a non-vigilante uh, uh, outcome. Uh, but if you have to take action, you've already called police, you can prove that you did, you start another fu uh, functional, another way of creating uh, an outcome, uh, and it, unfortunately you have to take action at what like you save someone's life. So no matter what country you're in, uh, you can create safety the same way because all of it in every language works exactly the same. We're using psychology, biomechanics, praxeology, uh, proxemics. So this is our own unique method of, of how we use praxeology and proxemics. It's not in the standard sense, 
but it works. And, and we know this because we have empirical results. All of us are alive, and more importantly than us being alive, all the people we protect are alive and safe. Awesome. And we're going to to Mexico. Definitely. It's great uh, uh, talking to you. I, great. I look forward to meeting you, sir. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm so glad you're going to be in Mexico because I feel like you have, one, a wealth of information to share. And it sounds like you have the craziest stories. Uh, maybe you can join us for one of our coffee chats in the morning. Um, Absolutely. Um, but, and we can all learn from your stories. And, and so, so thank you for sharing that with us. So we are going to wrap up. I wish Kat was here. She always has her handy dandy notebook <laughs> with all of her notes and, um, and she's so good at that, but I'll try to kind of summarize what I think was really important here. Um, one, you changed my mind. That was really important. You shifted my mind. So that was really important that you're uh, right. The focus should definitely be on having everyone be their best selves and having the skills required to operate in any environment. That's huge. And I, it sounds to me like operating from fear is probably the worst thing you can do. And so train yourself in order to deal with those sorts of situations. De-escalate, 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 view view the other person, view the person you're in conflict with like they are a family member and that's going to change how you communicate with them. That's going to make you more successful at de-escalating if you can share a little love. Um, and those are some of the major ones that are coming to me without Kat in her notebook. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I really, I really appreciate these things because again, like I said earlier in the conversation, we are anarchists and people think a lot of people think that means destruction, violence, confrontation, but that's not what we're about. We really are about peaceful communication, about respect for sovereignty and giving people the space to be free. And that also means respecting them, their ideas, trying to come to consensus. And it sounds like that's a lot of what happens with you guys with the Threat Management Center. So you are doing a fantastic, you're doing fantastic work and the way you communicate it has just been great. Uh, I want to give you and David an opportunity to give your final thoughts, um, and then we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, David, you thank you, thank you for introducing us all to this wonderful, like I, these wonderful ideas and thought processes. And yeah, yeah. Well, he's the one who's doing the work. I was so grateful you uh, came out to California to my Education Options Expo. And in that, I actually recorded it. It's called uh, Teaching Children to Become Their Own Bodyguard. So I think this is also a new paradigm shift where we start to learn how to protect ourselves physically. But as you mentioned, Dale, psychologically, what is the predator thinking about? And as you distinguish between the thug animal, I think, and the criminal, whatever it is, you know, give them the keys to your car, give them your phone, give them your wallet. Your life is more valuable than all the money on earth. That's how I feel. So understanding that some people yeah. out there are just angry at the world and maybe they had a rough childhood and they're on drugs or not or whatever, and they just want to cause violence. And I've met people like that. I'm like, I came from Smallville, California. I didn't think like that, but actually in talking with Dale and other people, I'm like, there's actually people who want to inflict violence because they enjoy it or they're letting out their aggression and you see the transformation. Said, man, you were like that? You're such a nice guy. It's like, no, I used to be a violent, you know, thug. And so... With this model, I'm so excited you're coming out there. The workshop, I recommend you guys look at the workshop, come online and learn. And whether you work with Dale in the future or you start your own thing, I think we're starting to realize that the police, sadly, have become a revenue generation enterprise and they're poorly trained. You know, God bless those people. But when you have a problem with your neighbor, go talk to your neighbor. You know, think about being the hero and being a peaceful person. It's uncomfortable. But being human, be, being a human in general is uncomfortable. There's challenges, there's difficulties. And if we confront these things, as you mentioned, maybe somebody's looking for their dog. Maybe they're just looking, maybe they're doing a training. You don't know their intention. So have the, the positive outlook. And then maybe they're on some type of you know, situation. They have mentally ill, but killing people is not the solution. This is why we see potential war with Iran. It's like, when are we gonna understand? When you kill somebody's family, they wanna come get revenge. And so, like just Dale mentioned, you save a baby, you save a family, and now they come back and give you hugs and give you love. So the theme this year is evolve. 
And we are the people we've been waiting for. We got to take a look in the mirror, as difficult as that is, men and women, and realize we have to learn this knowledge from champions like Dale and other organizations. But he's got this great model. I think it's been fine-tuned. I hope you come to Acapulco, ask a lot of questions, take advantage. You know, he's a busy guy. He's got, you know, lots of employees and he's all over the world traveling and, and speaking and training people. So use that time so you can learn and go to the workshop, spend some time with him. And so you can become the hero in your own community, because I think that's what the future is. We're seeing this fear about the coronavirus and like martial law. And it's like, if you're in a city, it's getting crazy. You want to have a community who believes in consensual, voluntary relationships. So if it does get situation critical, you're able to deal with it, whether it's EMT or uh, de-escalation. This is what we want to focus on. And I'm so happy that, uh, Dale, you spent some time. You have some good questions out there from the audience. And the future is voluntary, I believe. There's you no know, intergenerational time. There's going to be a lot of you know, years that we got to put into it. But we don't want to have violence for our children, violence for our grandchildren. And Dale, you're leading the way, so I'm so grateful for you. If you want to share a few thoughts as we wrap up and uh, before we close out for the night. Yes, please go to our website, threatmanagementcenter.com. Please Google us, uh, Detroit Threat Management Center. You'll see a lot of videos there of what we actually do, put media in the keywords. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the training is vital because even though we mean well, someone will misinterpret us. Recently, a woman was killed in Texas by police when they came to investigate her door being open. Uh, so some people say, well, why doesn't the man just go check on the neighbor himself? Well, it's two o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was. And so what another person would say is, why are you at my niece's house? Why are you at my sister's house? Why are you at my girlfriend's house coming over and knocking on her door at one o'clock in the morning? And it won't make sense that he's just checking on her. Okay, even though that's what he's doing. So there is a method though to doing that. And uh, the method is um, a combination of both the police and the, the neighbor, okay? It's a combination because you need the police to prove that you aren't doing something negative, which is why you called them. And you need to uh, handle this with your neighbor ahead of time by having her phone number to contact her, to call her, let her know this is a situation uh, or ask the question. And if she's not answering the phone, that's why you call the police also so that you, so that their family knows you cared enough to check on her. But you also physically go over there and end up in an altercation with her boyfriend or whatever could happen. There's a thousand ways that can go to the left, even though you mean well. So many people, that's what I hope to share in Acapulco is uh, how to actually create the outcome you're looking for without making mistakes and creating violence even by accident. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dale. Um, I, I'm excited that our community gets to use you as a resource to to become better people and become more prepared to deal with any situation. Um, that's very exciting. Um, so, uh, thank you. Yeah, we're we're two weeks out from Anarchapulco. Um, this concludes the. This is the end of conversations in anarchy for 2019 2020 season. Um, season we have. It's been such a great run with you guys. Stay tuned. We will pick up after February. But this is the last time we will meet in the digital space before Anarchapulco. We will then be hanging out and having our conversation. In the real world, or I should just say the non digital space. Um, so I'm excited to see all of you. We are excited to see all of you. Uh, the success of this series really has been fortifying the community and giving a voice to, uh, to people who are new to anarchy, uh, supporting each other, and exploring our personal freedoms. We appreciate everyone who takes the time to come and view and chat with us every single week. Those who are participating in the chat and on Facebook, on Twitch, DLive, YouTube, and maybe we'll be streaming in lots of other places soon. Um, if, you, if you guys are interested, let us know. Thank you for everyone who turns on their cameras so we can see your faces, and more importantly, so people can see your faces and know that they're 
people just like you, not crazy, spiky hair, dark, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, we what we want people to know about anarchy is that we run the gamut. We run the gamut, and it's not just one stereotype, um, and so that's what this conversation has been about, and you guys have made it hugely successful in that way. Um, share these conversations. They're avail available on YouTube and Facebook. Share these conversations with your friends and family, and, um, and let's keep the conversation going. So with just under two weeks, <laughs> we can't wait to see you there. Um, if you cannot be there with us, you can check out the live stream tickets on the ticket page at anarchovocal.com, and there are going to be some surprises there. Uh, the schedule will be published tonight, so keep your eyes open. If you haven't signed up for updates at anarchopolka.com, sign up for updates so you know what's happening for uh, throughout this Anarchopolka event and then beyond because we'll be moving into 2021 at some point too, and you're going to want to keep uh, in contact with us for those things. The workshops have been announced. Dale is doing his workshop on the 15th, and we have so many wonderful workshops, so you can you're gonna come into contact with new ideas and you get to create your own your own experience everyone's going to have a different experience and that's and that's going to be a really good environment for us to come together in and chat together as we are all learning more about uh about how to operate in this world so tickets are available for everything now at anarchovocal.com slash tickets 2020 all the stages have been announced you can check out all of the great speakers we have the whole there are still some hotel rooms available and to stay at the princess mundo imperial so that you can wake up with us and go to bed with us um there is so much information on the website on the blog that tells you what to expect you can get frequently and uh, oh, <laughs> frequently asked questions answered um, there at the site, and there are weekly updates on the blog. <sighs> so, spreading the word of personal freedom is powerful. It's helpful to all of us. We are about building community, about nonviolent communication, about evolving independently, individually, so that we can evolve together. Um, check out ways to get involved at anarchopolko.com too on the website. You can, you, I mean, in the world, but also you can suggest speakers, you can sign up to volunteer, you can submit yourself to become a performer. There's just so many ways to participate with Anarchopolko. Um, Thank you for giving us these opportunities, Jeff and Jessica, but there's so many ways for you to participate in this community and help it to keep growing. Kids Talent Show this year, David, thank you for putting that up there because that's something that I really can't wait for. I'm gonna try to get my kids performing. I think, I think at least one of them is super excited about it. And so if you have kids and you want them to be a part of that, you can head on over to, I think, we will have sign up, but it's not necessary to sign up. Just get your kids prepared and they can come on out and, and uh, show us what they've got. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. Well, we really appreciate you. Um, until Anarchy Bolo, uh, peace, love, and anarchy. Yeah. See y'all soon. Peace. <laughs>